It's a privilege to be here. Thank you for this honor, and it's a particularly privilege to follow uh, Dr. Chuck Denham, the quintessential servant leader. Dr. Denham has published about uh, leadership technologies and practice and spoke about those. Leadership in that triad is the force multiplier. So leadership is a social process to engage colleagues, to face challenges, and then conquer them. In this time with you, I'd like to share with you three products of this force multiplier of leadership for technology and practices. So we'll go to Sweden for a minute, we'll go to Newcastle, England for a couple, and then end up in Pepin, Wisconsin. So what happened in Sweden in 1967 that lowered the traffic fatality rate by 17%? They switched from driving on the left side of the road to driving on the right side of the road, and that lowered traffic fatalities 17% for three years. Because when people, the Swedes, came up to the intersection, they were mindful that something was different and there was an increased risk of an accident. And after three years, when they went back to their routine, the accident rates went up again. So mindfulness is is something that we can create and energize with transparency. I've never met a group of physicians or nurses or doctors who thought there was, their performance was as bad as it actually was until we measured it and transparently shared those results with them. So Asish Shah published in Health Affairs a couple years ago a survey of board chairs of some of the 5,000 American hospitals. And he looked at the worst performers, the bottom decile. What do you think the board chairs of the lowest 10% quality performer hospitals in the country thought that their performance was? Every one of them thought their performance was above average. And so we've got to unsettle the complacency by looking in the mirror with real data within an organization and across the country. One of the, some of the most important things we can do is put posters with real data in front of providers, in boardrooms, and in hallways for patients to see to catalyze action. A huge force multiplier uh, of, of transparency to um, have us perform as well as we can and to be aware of the opportunity to become better, to juggle us and jiggle us out of our complacency. So let's go to New England or Newcastle, England. What single thing can you do to a cow to increase her milk productivity by 68 gallons a year? Give her a name. Peer-reviewed research out of Newcastle, England that shows that if you give the cow a name, you use it, you treat that cow with respect, her productivity goes up 68 gallons a year. Well, guess what? The same is true for human beings. If you treat human beings with respect, their teamwork, their engagement, their productivity dramatically increases. Psychological safety is at the root of too many of our sentinel events and preventable deaths. Joint Commission tells us that over 50% of the central events in this country are the result of a communication or a handoff failure. What percent of nurses in this country, if they see a patient about to be harmed, are afraid to speak up and wouldn't speak up? 36%, about a third of nurses the frontline folks that care, no one cares more about the well-being of patients, are so intimidated that they aren't comfortable speaking up to, to stop something that could harm a patient. And, and so this is what we have to do to move the needle for patient safety. Build stronger teams, make sure everyone on the team is comfortable speaking up. So the, the surgical checklist the, that we've used across the world now, in peer-reviewed publications, we see that 
mortality rate goes down when that surgical checklist is used. One of the key drivers in that surgical checklist is at the beginning, before surgery, that the surgeon introduces everyone in the room, the anesthesiologist, the techs, the nurses, the supply, and that is one of the elements that drives better performance of that surgical team by having them comfortable with that uh, membership across the board. So let's go to Pepin, Wisconsin. 1944, we were deep in World War II. My mother was 13 years old in Pepin, Wisconsin. And she, along with tens of thousands of other uh, teenagers in America, went down the roadsides, along rail tracks, along field posts, collecting milkweed seeds. Imperial Japan had just taken over the Dutch East Indies, which was our primary, that was the only industrial source we had for floss. And floss was what we put into uh, life preservers for the 1.2 million life preservers we needed each year for World War II. And we had no industrial source for it. The milkweed seed is a source of floss, but we had no industrial uh, processing uh, capability. That would take three years to build. So we asked our teenagers to collect it. They got two million pounds of it. We made it into 1.2 million life preservers. And that was part of the reason for our success of the Allied forces in World War II. World War II, everyone was involved. Teenagers, women in factories, victory gardens, rationing cards. Everyone was involved one way or another in that effort across Europe and, and in America. And if we're going to be successful in this battle for healthcare safety, everyone has to be involved. It's not the board, not just the doctors, not just the nurses, not just the technology companies. Everyone has to be involved. So at Mayo Clinic, we have a quality caddy that we started uh, eight years ago. We train colleagues on teams for improvement opportunities. Uh, but we also have a quality fellows program where we can be certified at a, a bronze, silver, gold, or diamond level. It's a ma measure of competency that's basically equivalent of yellow, green, black, and, and master black belt uh, from ASQ. The first people to get certified uh, in our quality fellows program were John, Shirley, John uh, Noseworthy, our uh, neurologist chief executive officer, and Shirley Weiss, our chief administrative officer for uh, Mayo Clinic. Today we have 30,172 quality fellows at Mayo. That's over half of our 58,000 colleagues at 24 hospitals in five states. We're the first and largest integrated multi-special group practice. It's a pure salary system. So those 30,000 colleagues that stepped up to get certified didn't do it because there was a bonus or they got paid more or they required to do it. They did it because of volunteerism. If you have engaged employees that, that, that you use their name, they feel part of their team, they believe in your mission, they will give thousands of extra hours to help support what we're working for. It's, it's a priceless thing that if we, uh, not just for patient safety, but for engagement. So we have to have the mindset that in our organizations, we have two jobs. Our first job is to do our work, and the second job is to improve our work. And this basic systems competency that we do with our Quality Academy is one way that each of our colleagues that comes to work every day, they have two jobs. The, the second one is to improve their work and as part of this uh, volunteerism effort. But having John and Shirley be the first ones to go through the Quality Academy for this fellows program is part of what leadership is by walking the talk and, and uh, setting that example. And I'll end with, uh, with one more example of engaging everyone in, in this. Um, and that's the patient and their families. Uh, we have something now and the, uh, called share rounds. We instituted it maybe four years ago. Uh, so at every one of our units, every one of our 24 hospitals, 
uh, the nurses, when they make a transition from their shifts, instead of going in the back room, staring at a computer, or going over charts, they walk into the patient room, and in front of the patient and the family, go over what's important to know about Mrs. Smith, and the family and the patients are part of the team. And so, we're, so everyone is involved, not just the providers, it's, and the, the most important person on that team is the patient and his or her family member. So just not too long ago, we had uh, uh, the share rounds in front of a patient, one of our ICUs, a uh, family member had seen an hour or so before a respiratory tech come in and do her work uh, on the uh, uh, intubation uh, tube, and to do that, she had to turn off one of the monitors. She left the room and forgot to turn it back on. And the family member wasn't comfortable calling her on it, but when the nurses came in for the share rounds, they said, shouldn't that one be turned on? And of course. And that, that engages another person on this care team that we need, and we need everyone involved if we're gonna win this battle. So th those are three elements of, uh, of leadership products that are force multipliers for the practices and technologies that are absolutely necessary, but insufficient if we don't, because we've got to address the two biggest barriers in our cottage industry. The cottage industry is, is characterized by autonomy and this power distance index. The autonomy uh, in a cottage industry of physicians and other providers have working individually with the best interests in mind but not seeing the systems picture. We've got to standardize to excellence and deviate from that standard work only when there's a patient-centered reason for moving away from it. And the power distance index from that 68 gallons of milk that you get from a cow, if you treat her like a valid member of the team, also lowers that power distance index so he or she is comfortable speaking up when there's an opportunity for that person to contribute to your team. I applaud uh, the leadership for bringing us together and I applaud each of you for coming here and joining us in this effort. Thank you.